Okay, let's finish off this lecture. So, CCDs that we've talked about in the previous part of this lecture, they used to have advantages in resolution, because you can they're simple devices, you can make them very high resolution and small, dynamic range and low noise. But today, well, as we'll discuss in a second, CMOS imagers have eroded most of those advantages, and they're used much more often except for long wavelength infrared applications. So why might that be? Well, it's partially has to do with the fact that long wave, meaning infrared detecting uh, imaging devices, have to be cooled as well. And so when you do infrared imaging devices, you're using semiconductors which have, in terms of band gap energy, very narrow band gap energies. And these devices have to be cooled because thermal generation could generate so many electron hole pairs that it would be very difficult otherwise, if you didn't cool it, to basically just have optically generated carriers. The thermally generated ones could wash out the optically generated ones because, again, narrow band gap means it's easy to have, easier to have a significant amount of thermal generation. So why does this give uh, CCDs an advantage over CMOS? Well, these devices, if you're going to do CMOS, you need to have transistors. We'll see that in a second. It's very difficult with these type of semiconductors to make all the circuitry you need to do a CMOS imager. So to make these work well, they have to have a simple device like the CCDs we talked about where you just have a metal oxide semiconductor and you transport the charge out by moving a potential well. So in infrared applications, CCDs still do quite well. So let's look at visible applications where CMOS is continuing to dominate these days. So here's a simple CMOS imaging array right here. We got a bunch of rows, we have a bunch of columns. Let's start here, what's the orange part? Well the orange part we see here, if we look at a cross section, is just a simple photodiode. I've got basically p-type silicon for the substrate and n-type well. This is a simple photodiode which can collect charge. It would be electrons going, well let's draw it out. So here's my simple photodiode. Okay. And I would have electrons that are generated going toward the n-type region and holes going towards the p-type region. And so I could basically collect photogenerated charge in terms of electrons right here onto this photodiode. So here's my photodiode. Then looking here is a transistor. So this is just a simple FET. And so what's this do for us? Well, what this does for us is that we can have light shining on all of these pixels, building up the charges on all of these things. So I have all this charge building up here. The FET is turned off, so the charge continues to build up. And then, when I want to read out a row, I will basically put a voltage on this row here that turns all these transistors on and allows the charge to come out of the photodiode and down the column to the readout circuit. Again, the charge comes out of the photodiode because I turn the row electrode on to the column lines which is then read out to the readout circuit which amplifies it as well. Notice in this case that they're reading out things it looks like they're reading it out um, serially so they basically do this one read it out through a transistor amplify it to the output then they'll turn this one on and then read out this one on the circuit amplify it etc. So this is a, a highly serial way of reading out the data. This is called a simple 1T cell, meaning one transistor per pixel. It's called a passive pixel structure, meaning there's no amplification at the pixel. It has a very high fill factor, meaning most of the pixel area is the photodiode, which is good, but it also has a very high noise level as well. Here's a 3T cell, which is called an active pixel structure, because I have an amplifier, you can see here, at every pixel. How's it work? Well, look inside the pixel. Here's my photodiode. Here's a reset voltage. So I'll hit the reset voltage to basically reset this to some known voltage to start with. Light comes in, builds up electrons here. The electrons build up here, and they bias the gate of this FET such that when I turn the row column on and I want to read out voltage and current to the column, it's not basically depleting a tiny amount of charge out of this. It's not using that charge but rather that charge keeps this transistor on which biases actively the column line. So instead of having a fixed amount of charge which would basically, you know, a tiny amount of charge which would have to charge up this whole column line to get the data out of that pixel, 
In this case, that charge just drives a FET, which then drives current onto the column line and keeps driving current onto the column line until it represents the right amount of charge that was stored in the device. So this is an active pixel structure with local amplification of the charge. If you look at how this uh, uh, CCD looks like up to detail, you'll find that you have these typically active pixel structures along with color filters on the front of it. So if you look at the CCD array and you zoom in, you'll see what they call a bare mosaic color filter array. And this would be one pixel. One pixel, basically one color pixel. And so for within that, you've got a red, a blue, and two green subpixels. Why do we have different numbers of these uh, within one pixel? Well, we have two greens here because the human eye is more sensitive to green than anything else, right? A photodiode is not really responsive like the human eye. And so to basically see an image with the same level of brightness that you might see with the human eye, they put two green subpixels because the eye is more sensitive to green to get the same level of brightness for green. Notice that the green and the blue and the red are also a little bit auto-corrected because silicon photodiodes, if we'd mapped out photo, uh, responsivity of a, a silicon photodiode versus wavelength, we saw it went up and then down. And basically as we went to shorter wavelengths, in terms of towards the blue, the responsivity went down, and we can use that basically by accounting for the lower lumen per watt equivalent, lower sensitivity of the human eye to blue, by the fact that the photodiode is also less sensitive to blue light as well. So it automatically builds in the human eye sensitivity between red and blue. Because green's got such a big increase over them, you have to put two subpixels. Notice that these things are also in terms of lenses. This actually is not just a color filter, but it's also a little bit of a lens here. What's that do? Well, if you look at the pixel structure, here's the transistor and the elect local electronics, which amplify. Here's the photodiode. What the lens does is it focuses the light down only on the active region. Light falling on the transistor and other regions does nothing for us. We only want it on the photodiode. So this helps focus the light on the region, which will give us charge, which can be recorded in a useful fashion. Here's an example of, uh, of Olympus. These are the lenslets and color filters that are formed on top of there. So again, they take the light and they concentrate it onto the active part, as you can see here. And then there's a color filter on top of each area of the active part as well. How do you make a, a really good CMOS chip? Well, look what they've done here. They basically, in this case, here's your micro lens erases. Light, light comes in this way. Here's our red, green, and blue filters. Here are the actual photodiodes and then on the back side they put over here all the transistors so they have thinned this silicon down substantially so they can couple the photodiodes to transistors and other electronics on the back well, why they do this why they work so hard to do this this way because this silicon then is getting very thin well the reason why they do that is they can basically make these pixels really small and still have a large amount of area by not taking all this other connection circuitry and having it block the light on the front. So they put all the electronics and amplification on the back side so they can have maximum area on the front side just for receiving the light and detecting it. So I can get both higher resolution and higher light sensitivity that way. In terms of camera's quantum efficiency, if you understand responsivity for a photodiode, you can understand responsivity for a CMOS imaging array as well. If you look at these things, they both go up as you increase wavelength and then they go down. Why is that? Well, if you remember, they all go down as they go towards uh, around 1,000 uh, nanometers, 1 micron, because if it's made out of silicon, at that point, when you get past 1,100 nanometers, the photons of light don't have enough energy to create electron hole pairs in the silicon and so they're no longer absorbed. So this is showing stronger absorption but then at some point the absorption is strong enough where you need it to be. Sometimes it could be too strong where it is not absorbed in the right depth of the semiconductor but then you see it decrease also because as you go to shorter wavelengths of light they only generate one electron hole pair. So in terms of the incoming optical power, again responsivity is amps per watt, my incoming optical power is going up in this direction because of higher energy photons, but I'm only getting one electron hole pair, so the amps is not changing, so my amps per watt goes down. 
again, in terms of where things are headed with in terms of pixel resolutions, people are moving to really small resolutions. This is a tenth of a micron um, for the pixel sizes in some of these imaging devices. And it's at this point you could, you know, if you go to buy a, a camera or something like that, they might talk about some insanely small pixel sizes. But beware if you're a buyer, because a lot of these pixel sizes are now beyond which the optics on the camera can resolve. And so they're making pixels that are smaller than which you can even focus the light and get a non-blurry image anyway. And they're doing that just because they can say they have this on a spec sheet, but you as the buyer don't understand that it doesn't really do anything for you. So when you buy these type of chips for imaging applications, make sure you do your homework to make sure that your optics is able to provide the resolution that the pixels can achieve. And again, for all imaging devices, you have to have optics. If you don't have optics out front, you get nothing. So if I had a CCD chip sitting down here, it would get basically, let's say I had a, you know, something to image over here, and then I have something to image over here. I've got a tree over here. Well, wouldn't it basically light from the tree over here would fall here, the person would fall over here, and I would end up with a blurred image of all the light from all objects falling on top of this CCD array. So you would see nothing if you just took a CCD array and you tried to hold it up in a room and see various objects. What a lens does, as you can see here, is here's the object you're imaging. The rays of light from the object are focused through the lens and only at the focal point, this is where you put your CMOS array, do they come in focus. So objects of light that are from other angles will basically be scattered out and not come into focus where the CMOS array is here. And this is how a lens only brings things which are at the right focal length with the lens into focus and gives you a crisp picture. Without this, you can't make an imaging device. It's interesting to note in comparison uh, modern CMOS arrays to the human eye and in some ways the human eye is still superior. The human eye has a dynamic range of about a million to one in terms of the minimum brightness to the maximum brightness it can see. And so it's pretty amazing that biological systems have developed simple systems which have huge dynamic range and very high pixel densities compared to what you can do with uh, the best man-made technologies. Again, I mentioned that CCDs are losing ground to CMOS sensors, so this is just doing some comparison of different technologies, and the, 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 you know, the news is continuing that you're going to see more and more CMOS sensors and less and less CCDs over time. So that does it. At this point, we can, uh, you can review. You should be able to answer this based on the first slide we presented for the second part of the lecture. Um, for a CMOS array, you need two types of semiconductor devices. You should be able to know what those are. The color filters, we have to double the green ones, why we have to do that. We put lenses on top of the pixels, why we do that. And we always need a lens in front, why do we need that?